I know Bruce mentioned this to begin the worship service, but I just want to point out these communication cards. They're in the pew right in front of you. And if you look at them, if you just grab one of them real fast for me, you'll see that there's a backside to this card. So this card is now going to be the card that we use for all the communication with the church office, anything you want to get involved with, if you need to update your contact information, if you've joined First Union for the first Sunday and you want to let us know that you're here, if you've been here for 50 years and you want to find an area where you can serve, then this is the way to do that. And the other thing I want to point out is on the front side, there's a place where you can note prayer requests. And so there is a team of people within this church that is willing to pray for anything that you've got going on in your life. And so we encourage you to write down those prayer requests there. You can choose to put your name and let them know who you are, or you can just leave that anonymous, and they will assuredly pray for those needs. But please take advantage of this, and if you have guests that come and join you on a Sunday, make sure they fill this out so it gets into the church office. And then once it's filled out, you can either place it in the offering plate, which you can't do this morning because it's already passed, but you could also bring it to me, uh, you could bring it to Bruce, you can take it to any of the ushers that are serving on a Sunday, but make sure that this uh, card gets in and we'll make sure it gets to the office and to the appropriate person. All right, so this morning we're continuing kind of our conversation through the Old Testament in moving through some Old Testament scriptures leading up to the New Testament. And so we've been marching through, in the last couple of weeks, we, we've talked about uh, creation, we've talked about Moses last, last week and his call, or his reluctant call, to come and do the work of God. And this morning we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, which again is a passage or a text that many of us have heard about. But we're going to try to understand what it means in the context of God's unfolding story. So I want to begin by just showing you a simple pictorial representation of the story of God up on the screen. So if you'd switch to the first slide, there's an image uh, right after all the text. There's an image of the story of God, and uh, this shows the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. And I know it's kind of small, but you'll see that the story begins with creation, and we've talked about that creation, and it marches through as there's sin that enters the world. And then God starts to put together his plan to rescue us from that sin, from that fall. And so what we talked about last week is that the people of God, that God had gathered together through Abraham, these generations, were put into Egyptian captivity, into slavery. And you'll see that that happened over a 400 year period of time. And God raises up this person that we've been talking about, Moses. And Moses is going to be the one that rescues, that saves these people from this Egyptian slavery and captivity. And so last week we talked about how the, Moses is called to that task and he's reluctant in that task. But ultimately he's going to go to Pharaoh one after another saying, let my people go. Those people are let go. They run away and we have that miraculous splitting of the sea and the people pass through it. And they enter into this rescuing and we get this period of time that they're wandering around in the desert for 40 years before they enter into the promised land. The beginning of that journey, once they're rescued, Moses goes up on top of a mountain and God gives him these Ten Commandments. And so those are the Ten Commandments we're going to look at today. God enters into a covenant, an agreement with his people. He says, I will be your God if you will be my people. And I'm going to give you these rules, these laws these ground rules upon which our relationship will be based, and those very first rules, the very first ten rules we know as the Ten Commandments. Now, if you read on through the Old Testament, there's a lot more rules that come, but they begin with these first ten commandments that become the foundation of God's relationship with his people. So let's go ahead and read this passage. We're going to read De Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at verse 1, and then we're going to spend some time talking about it. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting at verse 1. It says, Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us. With all of us who are alive here today, the Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, and these are the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You, sh you shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation, those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or your maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any other of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that you may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire in your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. So this passage actually occurs in Exodus, and so this is really a later point in the story of God where Moses is really recounting this incident to the people of God that are gathered around him. And so the story, again, is that God's people have been rescued. And now this question that they ask is, what is our relationship going to be with this God that has now rescued us? And God tells them that you are my people. You are the descendants of Abraham. I carved you out of all the people of the earth so that the whole world would see that I am the one true God. And our relationship, our interactions, this agreement we have with one another, will help the rest of the world to see who I am as your God. And so the next obvious question that the people had was what will be the nation what will be the nature of this relationship that we have with one another? And so I have three main points I want us to see out of this passage. The first one is that God's laws emphasize covenant and community. Now, covenant is just a fancy biblical word for agreement. Or in our modern day, we might think of it as a, a contract. It's an arrangement that God makes with his people. God says, I will carve you out of the nations to be my people. I will rescue you from Egyptian captivity. I will bring you into the promised land. And in return, you will give me your allegiance. You will be my people. You will love me. You'll be committed to me. And these laws enter into that agreement as the basis for which their behavior will be to keep that connection with God. But what's important here is that it's not just that agreement, but it's also the community. It's how they're living with one another. You'll notice if you look at these Ten Commandments, and, and we aren't going to go through every single one of them, but they begin with commandments that emphasize how the people of God are to relate with God. And then you have this in-between commandment, which is about the Sabbath, that you're supposed to rest. And then the remaining commandments have to do with the people's relationships with one another. So we have both those emphases, how people relate with God and then how they relate with one another. And so at the beginning we find, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol. God ought to be the sole object of your affection. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord. If you remember last week, we talked about the name Yahweh in the Old Testament and how in our English translations, it's all caps Lord. And we talked about the genesis of that is that people believed that even the name of God was holy and reverent and infinite and beyond their understanding. Well, this passage here, 11, this commandment picks that up. Do not misuse the name of the Lord. And then we have the fourth, observe the Sabbath. Rest. Rest. 
Now, most of us, when we think of the commandments, this one comes to us as a surprise. We know not to murder people. We know not to steal. We know to give God honor. The rest one feels somewhat out of place. But in Sabbath, God wants to remind us that you and I are not the subject of the story. You and I are not the primary actor in this world. You and I do not hold the world together. No matter how busy your calendar might look, no matter how many notifications you might get on your phone, no matter how important you might think you are, you can rest the day and the world's not going to fall apart. In fact, God commands us to rest to remind us that the God of the universe is the one that's holding it all together. God sees our rest as as vitally important as the commandments he tells us later not to murder. Now, I find that convicting. I, I hope you do too. Actually, I hope you rest really well and you don't find it as convicting as I do. And then God moves in to the relationship-based relationship commandments. Honor your father and mother. Treat them with respect. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. You shall not want your neighbor's stuff. These are the community-oriented commandments. These are what make a community work. What bind us together. I was listening to a history book this week, and, and the story was about George Washington. And it was kind of recollecting all that happened in the, the beginning founding of our, of our country. And how we had this major war clearly against the British. And we got to this place where we were independent. And the first people were trying to decide, what do we do with this independence? And they looked at George Washington, and everything in them wanted to make him king. That was the model that they knew. It was how they understood the world to work. He was the one that had rescued them in many ways from the suppression that they thought they faced. They wanted to make him king. And George Washington, in his wisdom, resisted those instincts. Resisted that desire to have power. Allowed himself to have a term limit. Did not allow himself to be referred to as your majesty or the king. And in, even in the founding of our country, in this idea of democracy, there's this idea. Now, many of us have lost it because we, we talk about the government as this third party. But at its origins, the idea was that we come together as a people. And we set these rules and these principles and these ways of living that bind us together. And so the laws were selected by us. Our politicians were selected by us. And in some ways, our country, at least in its founding, was these are the things we are going to agree to value. These are the things we're going to agree to live by. In a similar way, it's what we're doing here in this Old Testament passage where the people of God are entering into an agreement with God. It's an agreement that the church of Jesus Christ has with God, that these are the ways we're going to live. And so let me make it very clear to you when we think about our nation, the nation is not the new Israel. The United States is not the new Israel. Let me make that abundantly clear. The church is the new Israel. You and I, when we proclaim faith in Jesus Christ, are more bound by our identity with Iraqi Christians, with Iranian Christians, with Christians around the world than we ought to be even with our fellow Americans who do not know Christ. Now, that's a, a radical idea, but you and I's number one allegiance is to the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, far more than it is to our country. God cars out the people of God and says, you will be my testimony to the nations. The next point I want to make is that God's laws are a gift to cherish and not a burden to bear. God's laws are a gift to cherish and not a burden to bear. Now, typically, when we think about rules, we think, man, those rules really constrain us. If I, if I could just do whatever I want, how much more fun would it be? These rules that God gives us are kind of lame. They constrain us or they constrict us. But God believes that these are the rules to orient our life by that give us freedom. They give us an opportunity to fully live into the relationship that he has for us. 
The only time, the first time and only time I got detention in high school was in geometry class. And I still remember there was a very clear rule, do not throw anything in class. And as the future lawyer that I was, I wondered, well, what does it mean to throw? <laughs> what counts as throwing? Obviously, if I'm standing above the trash can, I just drop it. That didn't seem to count like as a throw. So I, I tested it, right? A foot away. Well, she didn't seem to mind about that. That wasn't throwing. Well, there was a point <laughs> where it counted as throwing, and that's when I got my detention. Rules sometimes feel limiting, constraining. But these rules are set up often in our world, and certainly by the way that God gives them, to give us the opportunity to live into the freedom of how God set up the most fulfilling life we could have. That living in a community where people don't murder each other is freeing. Living in a community where people don't steal what others have is actually freeing. Being in a classroom where the goal is for you to learn and people aren't throwing objects past you allows you to be free to learn in the way that the classroom was intended to be. One of the projects that I'm working on in my day job is the Tracy, I'm the executive director of the Tracy Family Foundation and uh, one of the projects, one of our goals, that by the end of 2020, 2020, we're going to open an early childhood education center in Mount Sterling in Brown County. And when I began working on that project, I knew zero about early childhood education centers. I knew there was a need, and so once we identified that need, we knew we had to research the living daylights out of it to figure out how we were going to pull this project off. And one thing I learned is in that space, there are all sorts of rules and regulations. Square footage that the classrooms need to be, certain ratios of teachers to students, certain qualifications those teachers must have, Certain ways that everything is orchestrated with teachers being in the classroom when kids go to the bathroom and having multiple people and security and I mean just pages after pages of rules. And it feels like a burden, but it also is designed to protect kids, to help them to be in the best environment for them to flourish and to grow. <clears throat> and Jesus, God, give us rules in order that we might live in a full and righteous relationship with him. Notice that the commandments begin with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It begins in relationship. Because I brought you out of slavery, because you are my people, because I love you, because I care about you, live according to these principles. Now, I've told you a little bit about my testimony in following Jesus. I grew up believing that my relationship with God was dependent upon me doing good things. When I did what was right, God loved me. When I made a mistake, God did not love me. It was really that simple in my mind. And so I grew up as a kid working my tail off to be a good kid, to do the right thing. Now, that's not a bad thing. I hope all our kids try to do the right thing. But my theology was deeply scarred, was deeply flawed. Because what happens if you believe your relationship is based upon whether you do good things? As sinful people, we inevitably mess up. We get detentions in geometry class by trying to throw things. We treat people poorly. We, we make all sorts of mistakes. And when we make those mistakes... We falsely believe that the God of the universe is walking away from us. My freshman year of college, some guys were going around knocking on dorm room doors, asking and inviting people to be a part of a Bible study. And so because I wanted to be a good kid, I said, yeah, I'll be a part of that Bible study. And something happened in that Bible study. These guys were reading this Bible, and they were listening to God's word, and they were seeking to live into it, something I'd never experienced before. But the thing that was most profound to me is they were telling a story of a God who first loved me, who first cared for me, whose love was not dependent on me being perfect, but who invited me to be a part of his family unconditionally through me wanting to be a part of his family. 
And then he gave me these rules. He gave me these ground rules to live into relationship. But our relationship was not based upon them. And I was overwhelmed for the first time with the gospel of Jesus and the freedom that it gave. That I didn't have to be afraid of failure. I didn't have to be afraid of falling short because God loved me unconditionally. It was my desire to be a part of his family, to to be close to him that bound us with one another. And all of a sudden it just washed over me like a flood of love. A flood of caring, a flood of relationship. And I felt more free than I'd ever felt before. And what was remarkable about it, I felt more committed to try to live into that relationship than I ever had before. Isn't that how our relationship with kids are? I don't love my kids because they usually do the right thing, I don't stop loving them when they make a mistake. I'm committed to them and I love them because we're a part of a family together. And the rules I set up, the ground rules we give them, are intended to help them to live into that love that we already have for them in the most flourishing way. I want them to wear a helmet. I I don't want them to run out into the road. I want them to learn to share because I believe that they will have the most flourishing life if they're able to live into those ideals that we're given. The last thing I want to point out is that Jesus, and Jesus says this in the Gospels, that Jesus does not abolish the law, but he fulfills it. Sometimes when we talk about the Old Testament law, we pretend that when Jesus comes along, none of it matters anymore. That's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is that the law pointed to him. He doesn't abolish it. He doesn't get rid of it. He fulfills it. And in fact, with the Ten Commandments, he makes the commandments harder. In the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, we get to do not commit adultery. And some of us start to feel good about ourselves, and then Jesus says, well, hold on for a second. When when we say do not commit adultery, what we mean is do not even lust after another person. The Ten Commandments say do not murder. And Jesus says, well, hold on for a minute. We don't just stop at do not murder. Do not even hate another person. And then all of a sudden we realize what's happening in the law, that the law is a mirror. It's intended as a mirror that God gives us to look and to see that we cannot be perfect. And what it's doing is it's giving a taste. It's helping us to see our desperate need for God to step into the world and to rescue us. Because when we're really honest and we look in the mirror, we realize that we are a mess. That we are sinners, that we are broken, that we make mistakes. That no matter how hard we try, we cannot be perfect on our own. And there's a certain desperation that comes from that. A certain hopelessness. And to that, looking in the mirror and seeing our true selves, the God of the universe says, it's okay, I'm going to come rescue you. I'm going to put on flesh in Jesus Christ. And I will be perfection for you. I will rescue you from that brokenness. I will extend to you forgiveness. You and I cannot follow the law perfectly. We cannot check every box. And yet that is exactly why we come to worship on Sundays. Because we know that is true about us. And we come to worship a God who so loved us that he did not leave us in that brokenness, but came to rescue us. And he says, and you don't enter into relationship with me by being perfect, by working harder. But you enter into relationship with me by believing by trusting, by seeking forgiveness, seeking reconciliation. And if you genuinely seek to be in relationship with God, he will forgive you. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will rescue us. And he will allow us to be children in his family, experiencing the peace and the joy, the contentment that only he can offer. It begins with this law, these rules, 
that God gives his people. It's the beginning of the story that he brings into fulfillment in Jesus Christ.